So the first thing we're going to talk about today is um, limits of functions at their vertical asymptotes. So we're going to look at the function f of x equals 1 over x minus 2. And I've, we already got it sketched over here, a nice uh, screenshot from Desmos. We know that the vertical asymptote of, of y equals x minus 2 is at x equals 2, right? Everybody should be good with that because the denominator um, would be 0 if x equal 2. Everybody agree with that? Yep. Yep. All right, spectacular. So as we approach that vertical asymptote at x equals 2 from the right-hand side, we'll see that our function increases, right? It's going up towards that vertical asymptote. We say that it increases without bound because it's going up towards positive infinity. It's going up forever while not actually ever making it over to this next numeric value of 2. It's increasing without bound. Uh, so as x approaches 2 from the right, this limit of f of x is infinity. And if we look from the left-hand side, as x approaches 2 from the left, our function decreases without bound, and we would say that this limit is negative infinity. Everybody good with that? Yeah. All right, cool. Yep. So the thing about these limits that equal infinity or negative infinity is that really they don't exist. We say they're infinity, we say that they're negative infinity, but we really just say that to give ourselves kind of an idea of how the graph is behaving, of what the graph actually looks like. Um, technically, those limits don't exist because our definition of a limit says that it has to be approaching some real number value, and infinity and negative, negative infinity are not real number values. So, so technically, they don't exist. It's just a description of how that behaves. Um, so we're going to use infinity and negative infinity, but be aware that technically they don't exist and so if you're sitting there in may hopefully in person taking this ap test um you'll see a multiple choice question probably and um somewhere in it, one of the answer choices might be infinity or negative infinity for one of these um, or the answer choice might say it does not exist it may not have the infinity or negative infinity there and in, in that case you'll have to know that it could be either one of those um, they won't give you both of those as an answer choice on the same question, but um, they could give you either one. So just know that uh, it's infinity or negative infinity, but also know that technically it doesn't exist. Everybody good with that? Yeah. All right, cool. So i um, got a couple little quick sketches here. This first one on the left there, as we approach negative one from the left, what's the limit? Positive infinity. Positive infinity. What about from the right? Positive infinity. All right. So we could then say that the limit as x approaches negative one of this, we'll call it f of x, is equal to infinity. We could we could call this one infinity. On the previous one, right? If we asked what's the limit as x approaches two, we'd have to say for sure this doesn't exist because one's negative infinity, the other's positive infinity. But here, since they're both infinity, we could say that this limit is infinity, even though we know technically it doesn't exist, we still would say that just so we had a better idea of how the graph behaves. For the second one here, both the left-hand side and the right-hand side are negative infinity. And so we could say that this limit as x approaches three, it looks like I've got there, is negative infinity. And then this one here is the one we were just looking at. So from one side, it's negative infinity. And from the other side, it's infinity. Um, all three of these cases, obviously, can happen on various graphs where it might be infinity from both sides, might be negative infinity from both sides, or it might be um, one on each side. Easy enough? Yes. Yep. Spectacular. All right. So now what we want to be able to do is without having to sketch the graph, we want to be able to find the one-sided limits at each of the vertical asymptotes, as well as find the two-sided limit at, um, at the asymptotes. So this one only has one asymptote. Where does this function have an asymptote? At x equals 4, right? I think that's uh, that was kind of static -y, whoever said that, but I think you said x equals 4. So 
let's take a look at the limit as x approaches 4. You guys want to do from the left or from the right first? The left. The left. All right. Look at that. Somebody <laughs> making a decision here. Excellent. So let's think about what happens here. As I approach 4 from the left, what's the numerator going to be? It's just going to be 1, right? I mean, as x approaches 4 yeah. from the left, 1 is still just 1, right? Um, but as x approaches 4 from the left, that's a number like 3.999999999999999, et cetera, right? And 3.999999 minus 4 is what? A very small number. A very, yeah, very small negative number. Very small negative. We want to make sure we clarify this is a very small <laughs> negative number down here. Okay. Now, I'm being real technical here. You can see in my denominator, a small negative. And then what am I doing? A small negative number that's in the denominator? I'm raising it to the third power, right? And so what happens if I take a very small negative and I cube it? You get a smaller negative. Yeah. Still negative. Yep, I get an even, even smaller, smaller negative. negative number, exactly. And we'll say then this just becomes one over a very small negative. Because a small negative, whether it's smaller than the other small negative, is still a small negative. Um, and what's one divided by a very small negative number? A very large number. That should be a very large negative, negative number. number. Right. And so we would say that this is negative infinity. Everybody good with that? Yes. Yes. Yep. All right. Wonderful. So then let's look at the limit as x approaches 4 from the right-hand side of f of x. Well, what happens is if we approach 4 from the right, that's something like 4.000000000000001. And when I subtract 4, what do I get? I get a very small positive number. Right. And when I take that very small positive number and cube it, we end up with a very small positive number. And 1 divided by that should be a very large number. Large very number. large number. Very large positive or just infinity. So we can see that from the left hand side of 4, this graph is going down towards negative infinity. And from the right hand side of 4, it's going up towards positive infinity. And we could then say that the limit as x approaches 4 of f of x does not exist. Any questions on that? No. All right. Let's take a look at this one. Um, you guys want to see if you can do this one on your own real quick? Yeah. All right. Give it a try. I'll give you like one minute here while I go deal with my children that are not in their classes like they're supposed to be. All right, how'd this go? You should have been looking at a limit as x approaches what what value? Two. 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 And uh, let's do it from the left, I guess, first of f of x. The numerator is still just a one, right? And if we're approaching from the left, well, 1.99999 minus the two is a very small negative. But yep. when we take that small negative and square it, we end up with a small positive. Positive, so this should be positive infinity. And as we go from the right hand side, 2.000000001 minus 2 is a small positive. Squared is still a small positive, so we got 1 over a small positive, which is infinity. 
So we could then say that even though it doesn't really exist, the limit is x approaches two of f of x is infinity. And what that's telling us is that at x equals two, from both the left and the right, our function is going up towards that vertical asymptote, not dropping and falling towards it. Good? Yep. Everyone got the idea on these? Not too terrible? Yep. All right, let's do this one. Last one of these, I think, that we'll do, and then we'll move on and talk about some other stuff. So at the asymptotes, the vertical asymptotes of this function, we want to find uh, we want to find the limits. So first, we got to find those asymptotes. How do we find the vertical asymptotes of this? Factor the denominator. Yeah, we're going to factor out that denominator. So this is going to be 4x over what? x minus? x minus 3, x minus 1. Minus 3, x minus 1. So what are our vertical asymptotes? Uh, it's the uh, positive 1, positive 3. Exactly. What do you guys want to do first? One or three? One. One? You want to do it from the left or from the right? <laughs> left. 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 All right. X approaches one from the left of f of x. So as x approaches one from the left of f of x, what's the numerator going to be? Four. Basically four, right? And what about the denominator? We're going to have one, basically one minus three, so that's going to be a negative two, right? And then from the left, that's going to be 0.9999999 minus one, which is a small negative. Or... Yeah, small negative. And so now we've got two negatives down there in the denominator, which is going to turn that into a positive, a very positive. small very small positive, so four over that very small positive should be positive infinity. Everybody good with that? Yep. Spectacular. Limit as x approaches one from the right of f of x then. What about the four x? Is it going to change? It's going to be four. Still going to be four. What about that negative two we had? It's still going to be negative two? All right, and then now we're going to have a very small positive. positive positive number down there, which is going to turn this into a small negative in the denominator because of the negative 2. And the 4 divided by that small negative should be negative infinity, telling us that the limit as x approaches 1, the two-sided limit of f of x, does not exist. Good? All right, so just make sure that you're careful with all of your different signs within it, especially when you got different things like an x minus 3 and an x minus 1, not just like an x minus 1 squared or something down there. All right, so um, let's do 3. Let's do the limit as x approaches 3 from the left of f of x. Uh, hold on a second. I got people coming to my front door. My, it's my wife's birthday today, and she's not here. So I gotta. I'll be back in a second. Do this. Uh, do this three from the left and three from the right. I'll be back in a sec. All right, sorry about that. You guys do this one for uh, three from the left already without me, hopefully? Yeah. All right, so what's the top become? 12. 12. And the bottom should become, as we come towards three from the left, that first part should be a small what? Negative. Negative. 
and then the three minus the one should be a positive two. And so what does this first one become? Negative infinity. Negative infinity, good. And as we approach three from the right, the 12 should stay the same. That denominator there should become a small positive, positive. for the first part. And then that two should stay as a two, giving us positive infinity, showing us that the limit as x approaches three of f of x does not exist. Everybody good with that? Everybody feel all right there? Yep. All right, so take a look at this. I'm gonna be back in just a second. Okay, sorry. I don't know. It's my, like I said, it's my wife's birthday, and people keep showing up at our front door with stuff for her, but she's not here. So then, I don't know. So people are like yelling at the front door and all this. I don't know. Um, are we ready? Everybody good? Is that supposed to be a one over X? Yeah, it's supposed to be okay, a one. Just wanted to make sure. There's like a really, really light line there that you can't quite see because sometimes this program is garbage. All right. So what happens as we put in large numbers for x, as x goes towards infinity? So now we're going to look at limits as x goes to, to infinity, not x limits where it is infinity or negative infinity. So as x goes towards infinity, what happens to 1 over x? Becomes a 0. Yeah, oh. 1 over x becomes very, very close to 0, right? And yeah. so we just end up with 2. So what is the graph of this function doing as the x values increase without bound? As the x values get exceptionally large, what is the graph of 2 plus 1 over x doing? What does it look like? It's approaching a horizontal asymptote that right. uh, y equals 2. Exactly. It's giving us a y equals 2 uh, horizontal asymptote. All right. So let's real quick, I'm going to throw open Desmos here real quick just so we can see. Um, what was it, 2 plus 1 over x? Is that what I had there? Yeah. All right, cool. So 2 plus 1 over x, there's our horizontal asymptote of y equals 2. We can see um, it going off here to the right as x goes towards infinity. It's approaching y equals 2, that horizontal asymptote. Everybody good with that? Yep. Okay, cool. Now, we'll see also that this has a horizontal asymptote going in the left direction too, right? Also of y equals two. But we yeah. did not find that by looking at the limit as x approaches infinity. As we look at the limit as x approaches infinity, this is really just a horizontal asymptote to the right. In order to find any horizontal asymptotes to the left, we'd have to look at what? The limit as x approaches Negative infinity. Negative infinity of 2 plus 1 over x. And in this case, what does that end up being? It also ends up being 2. two. So we got y equals 2 as a horizontal asymptote to the left. And we would say that this has a horizontal asymptote of y equals 2 in both directions. Good or no? Yes. All right, so yep. if we are investigating horizontal asymptotes, the way we do it is we look at limits to infinity and limits to negative infinity. So that's what we're gonna work on now for the next few minutes here. Um, you have probably seen a bunch of rational functions that look like this, 2x squared minus five over three x squared plus x plus two or something like that, right? Bunch of, bunch of rational functions like that, You've probably seen them before. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you probably know some rules about horizontal asymptotes for rational functions that you hopefully learned a year or two or seven ago. Yes. Yeah, so we're gonna prove those three rules for horizontal asymptotes right now.
So, um, oh. everybody okay? Yeah, you just muted there for a second. Uh, yeah, yes, yeah, so my kid came over to talk to me. He wants, he wants to ride his scooter to Starbucks. I'm like, you have class again in like seven minutes. And no, I don't understand. He doesn't even have any money. I don't know what he thinks he's going to do at Starbucks. Um, kids are weird. Um, you guys aren't used to me. Like, I, this is what I do is I'll go in my class and rant about my children all the time because that's what I do. But now I can't do it as much because they're like wandering around and they'll know how insane they are. So, oh well, life goes on. Um, let's do these horizontal asymptotes. That's a good idea. Let's look at the limit as x approaches infinity of 2x squared minus 5 over 3x squared plus x plus 2. So, the method that we're going to use to find this horizontal asymptote is we're going to take the largest degree in either the numerator or the denominator, which in this case are the same, right? The highest degree is what? Two. 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 And we're going to divide each piece of it by x squared. So we're going to divide 2x squared minus 5 by x squared and 3x squared plus x plus 2 by x squared. And what's that going to give us? In the numerator, the 2x squared over the x squared is just 2. And the minus 5 over the x squared is minus 5 over x squared. Everybody agree with the numerator there? Yep. All right. And what should we get down there in the denominator? You should get a positive 3 plus 1 over x plus 2 over square uh, uh, x squared or x to the power of 2. Yep, 2 over x squared, exactly. And as x goes towards infinity, 2 is just 2, right? But what about minus 5 over x squared? What does that become? 0. 0. 0. Okay, so we got 2 minus 0. And the denominator, we got 3 plus what? 0 plus zero. 0. So we end up yeah. with 2 thirds. And we probably remember from way back when that the rule for horizontal asymptotes for a rational function, or one of the three rules, was if the degree of the numerator and the degree of the denominator are the same, what do you do? You divide the leading coefficients. Well, this is why that works. Right? By taking a limit as x goes towards infinity and dividing by that highest power, we can show that what we get is two thirds. And if we were doing this with negative infinity, let's, let's pretend we were doing this with positive or negative infinity the whole time. Negative infinity, as x goes to negative infinity, this is still going to be 0, 0, and 0. So for any regular rational function, the limit as x approaches positive or negative infinity um, is going to be the same. It's not going to change. We're going to have the same horizontal asymptote in both directions. Everybody good? Yeah. Any questions? So that rule where you divide by x squared on both of them, it only applies for if the leading or for the degree of the numerator and the denominator are equal? Um, the, where, you, where you divide by the highest degree? No, we're going to whether they're the same or not, oh. we're still going to divide by the highest degree. Uh, but we're going to get okay, the so you just divide. Yeah, so, so the, the original rule that you learn in like in a grade three maybe or in honors pre-cal or regular pre-cal or whatever the pre-cal class you take, take is, um, is that if the degrees are the same, divide the leading coefficients. But when we're doing limits and actually proving these asymptotes, the, the right method is always going to be divide by the highest degree. So whether okay. the degrees are the same or not, we're going to divide by the highest degree. So when we look at this next one here, we got, it's almost the same, but it's 2x squared minus 5 over 3x to the fourth plus x plus 2. We're going to divide by the highest degree total, and the highest degree total is 4. So we're going to divide everything by x to the fourth power. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right, cool. So let's do that. We're going to look at the limit as x approaches. And this is a rational function that's going to be the same whether we do positive or negative infinity. So I'm going to write both of them there. Um, the limit as x approaches positive or negative infinity of f of x should be 
the same as the limit as x approaches positive or negative infinity of 2x squared minus 5 over, what are we going to divide them all by? x to the fourth. x to the fourth. And all over 3x to the fourth plus x plus 2, all divided by x to the fourth. So far good? Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. And now, what's 2x squared over x to the fourth? 2 over x squared. squared. 2 over x squared, and then the minus 5 over x to the fourth. That's just that. 3x to the fourth over x to the fourth is 3, plus 1 over x cubed, plus 2 over x to the fourth. Everybody good there? Yep. Cool. yep. And as we go towards positive or negative infinity, 2 over x squared is 0. 5 over x to the fourth is 0. 3 is 3. 1 over x cubed is 0. And 2 over x to the fourth is 0. And so what do we get? We get 0 over 3 or just 0. Good or no? All right. And if you remember back from uh, last year, you had a rule for the horizontal asymptotes of rational functions that was if the degree of the numerator is less than the degree of the denominator, the horizontal asymptote is always y equals zero. And this is why that's the case, because you'll always end up with a zero in the numerator because the degree in the denominator is larger. When you divide your smaller power by your larger power in the numerator, everything will end up canceling out and becoming zero. Does that make sense? Where that rule comes from? Mm -hmm. Yep. Cool. All right, we got one more case to do, right, where the degree of the numerator is more than the degree of the denominator. Then we can look at the ones where it gets a little more complicated, because these ones are pretty straightforward, I think. So we're going to use the same idea. We're going to divide by the largest power, which in this case is what? x cubed. x cubed. So we got positive or negative infinity, and we're going to divide 2x cubed minus 5 by that x cubed, and we're going to divide 3x squared plus x plus 2 by that x cubed. So um, 2x cubed over x cubed is going to be what? 2. Minus the 5 over x cubed. And the denominator, we're going to have 3 over x, 1 over x squared, and 2 over x cubed all added together. And everything yep. but the what becomes 0? The 2. Everything but the 2 will become a 0, which is going to tell us that this becomes 2 over 0 which is undefined or does not exist, and therefore there is no horizontal asymptote when the degree of the numerator is more than the degree of the denominator. Everybody good there? Yep. Any questions? Um, well, now that we've proved this, uh, the horizontal isentope rules together, uh, is it like a given now, or will we still have to prove it eventually? Um, so, on the AP test, there is a chance that they may ask you what are the horizontal asymptotes of something, and you justify it using limits. So, if they ask you to justify it using limits, you need to know how to do this. Um, but if it just wants to know what the horizontal asymptote is, you, it's just a rational function. You can just use the rule and figure it out. But generally, they'll ask you to justify it using limits. So. All right. Um, is there a way to prove the slant asymptote? Um, to prove what it is? Um, not exactly, because if you have, um, when you've got your slant asymptote, um, the limit, I mean, there is, but not exactly. It, you can prove that there is a slant asymptote. Um, just because as we go in here, we know that this, um, is 2 divided by a very small number. And 2 divided by a very small number 
means that it's going towards infinity. So we know that it's going up towards infinity, um, which tells us that there's a slant asymptote. So if we're going towards infinity, as we go toward positive infinity, there's a slant asymptote, but it doesn't tell us what it is. The only way to figure out what it is is to actually do long division um, between the two pieces of your fraction. So divide the okay. 2x cubed minus 5 by the 3x squared plus x plus 2. Yeah. Is that good? Does that answer your question? Yeah. All right, cool. All right. Let's look at another one here. This one's a little more complicated. This one is not a rational function. We have a square root inside of there. And so it's gonna, that's gonna affect stuff a bit. So first, let's, let's do these separately. Let's do infinity and negative infinity separately. So we'll start with the limit as x approaches infinity of root 9x squared plus 3 over 4x plus 3. It's plus 2. Oh, plus 2. Sorry. Good news is that's not going to matter. We'll change it to a 2 anyway. Um, as x goes towards infinity, um, one, one second, I got somebody else knocking at the door. All right, so sorry about that. So we got the square root of 9x squared plus 2, we got the 4x plus 3. And as x goes towards infinity, um, in the denominator, 4x plus 3, the, the bottom piece here, 4x is going to go towards infinity, but the plus 3 is pretty insignificant in comparison to the 4x. Would you guys agree with that? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And in the numerator, the root 9x squared. Um, is a lot more significant than just this plus two that's inside the square root. That plus two is pretty insignificant. Yep. And so as we go towards infinity, effectively, what do we get here? We get just the square root of 9x squared, and we really just get the 4x, because the plus two and the plus three pretty much mean nothing, right? Especially when we divide by the highest power, they go towards zero like they did before. So what is the square root of 9x squared? 3x. Close. Very close. Plus minus nah. 3x. Okay, not quite plus minus, but even closer. It is when you take the square root of something, it's always positive, right? So it's the absolute value of 3x. It's the positive version of 3x over 4x for the denominator. Everybody okay with that? That's, a, that's kind of a rule that hopefully you learned a long time ago when they first started having you square root x squareds and they said, okay, the square root of x squared, it's not actually equal to x, it's actually equal to the absolute value of x because suppose x is negative two. Well, the square root of negative two squared is the square root of four, which is two, which is the opposite of this negative two that you started with. Um, and if x is, let's say, two, then the square root of two squared is two. And so what we say is the square root of x squared is always equal to the absolute value of the x value that you started with. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. Okay. So. We got absolute value of 3x over 4x. And if x is positive, the absolute value of something that's always positive is just what you started with, right? The absolute value of a positive is that original thing. The x's will cancel, and what do you get? You get 3 fourths, right? Everybody yep. good with that? OK. But what happens when we go towards 
negative infinity. <laughs> the limit as x approaches negative infinity of f of x it still comes out to be the same absolute value of 3x over 4x. But now the argument of the absolute value, the thing inside the absolute value, starts off as a negative. And so when you take the absolute value of a negative, what do you have to do? You take the opposite of it. So this becomes the limit as x approaches negative infinity of negative 3x over 4x. And now the x's cancel, and we end up with negative 3 fourths. So we have an asymptote of y equals 3 fourths to the right, and we have an asymptote of y equals negative 3 fourths to the left. Does that make sense or no? Anybody? Any questions on that? Or are we okay with that? Wait, so we disregard the 2 and the 3 because we're dealing with infinity? Correct. And the x squared being square rooted, which is basically like an x, uh, dominates that plus 2, right? Infinity plus 2 is just infinity. Same down here. Infinity plus 3 is just infinity. The plus 2 and the plus 3 become insignificant. You can just like forget about them the, for the rest of the problem? Yep, exactly, because as you go to infinity, the rest of it is so much larger than it, they don't matter at all. Um, I mean, they matter enough to say that as we go towards infinity, it's getting very, very, very close to three-fourths. The reason it doesn't quite get to three-fourths is because of that two and three. Um, and the reason it doesn't quite get to negative three-fourths is because of that two and three. But they're so insignificant that within the context of finding that asymptote, they don't matter. They're the, they're the difference between the function and three-fourths as we go towards infinity, and the function, the difference between the function and negative three-fourths as we go towards negative infinity. Does that make sense? Or no? Well, we have 9x squared plus 2, right? And what was it, 4x plus 3? So we can see as we go towards infinity, we're approaching an asymptote of 3 fourths. As we go towards negative infinity, we're approaching an asymptote of negative 3 fourths. Everybody good with that or no? Um, so you said that in rational functions, the horizontal asymptotes are always equal. So any other function besides rational, there can be two different horizontal asymptotes. There could potentially be two different ones. Yep. Okay. Not necessarily going to be two different ones, but there, there could be. Yep. Okay. Any other questions on that? Why does the negative infinity turn it into negative three four? Uh, sorry, say that again. Why does negative like infinity turn it into negative three fourths instead of positive three fourths? Right. So, so what we're looking at here is we get to this point and it's exactly the same, right? Except we have negative infinity. You're good with you're good with that three x being inside an absolute value. Yeah. Okay. So, the absolute value of x equals x if x is greater than or equal to zero. But the absolute value of x is equal to the opposite of x if x is less than zero. So right, like if you put in, well, you know, what's the absolute value of two? Well, it's two because x was positive. But what's the absolute value of negative two? Well, it's the opposite of negative two. It's positive two because x was less than zero. We had to take the opposite of what was inside the absolute value. And so that's effectively what we're doing here. We're saying 3x, this number 3x, is a negative number, right? Because x values are going towards negative infinity. So no matter what, the thing inside the absolute value is already a negative. So when we take its absolute value, we take the opposite of the thing inside of it. So 
that's the opposite of 3x, and that's where the negative sign comes from. It gets pulled out to become negative 3 fourths. Does that make sense? Yeah, thanks. Yep, no problem. Any other questions on that one? This one shows up almost every single year in the multiple choice. Now, it didn't last year because there was no multiple choice because everybody took the test online and it was all pre-response. But um, every other year, there's been something similar to this in the multiple choice section or sometimes in the pre-response section of the AP test. So um, any questions on that? You got to make sure you understand that one. Why isn't the 4x negative? Um, the 4x, the number itself is negative, but it's just a 4x, right? I mean, if you look in the denominator up here, it's just a 4x. So on the denominator down here, it should still just be a 4x. Um, when we plug in the negative, if we plug in a negative infinity to it, you know, um, these numbers would become a positive in the numerator and a negative in the denominator, which is still going to give you a negative out here. Oh, I see. Right, but we don't actually end up plugging in a negative number because um, this x over this x can just cancel out and we're just left with a negative three fourths. But either way, it comes out to be the same. Good or no? Wait, if you said this will appear, well, uh, according to your experience, it appeared every year on the AP test as in like multiple choice. What would the multiple choice answers even look like? Um, you know, it'll ask you what are the what are the what is the horizontal asymptote, or what is um, the limit as x approaches negative infinity of this function? And you know, the answer choices would be like doesn't exist or there isn't one, three fourths, negative three fourths, and then something like two thirds or something like that maybe. I see. So yeah, and then. You know, 75% of the people get it wrong and say that it's positive three-fourths, even though it's, you know, negative three-fourths as you go towards negative infinity. So. Good or no? Everyone good? Yep. All right. So, how much time we still got? We still got some time or no? Yeah. Okay, let's do a couple more then. Oh yeah, we got plenty of time, all right. So let's think about the function e to the x and the function e to the negative x. So hopefully you're familiar with what those look like, but let's throw them on Desmos real quick just for you to take a look in case you're forgetting. e to the x, right, looks like this. As a horizontal asymptote to the left of zero and to the right it goes up towards infinity. And e, so the negative x is just the mirror image of that across the y-axis. And right, so it has a horizontal asymptote to the right of y equals zero and goes up to infinity as we go as x goes towards negative infinity. Everyone good with those two graphs? Yep. All right. Cool. So then what I'd like you to do on your own for just a second here is figure out what each of these four limits are and then we'll talk about them in a second make sure you guys got them right So what do we get for the first one? As x goes towards infinity, what is e to the x? Infinity. Infinity. The infinity, right? And as x goes to negative infinity, what should e to the x be? Zero. 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 Good. And, and as x goes towards infinity, what should e to the negative x be? Zero. 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 And as x goes to negative infinity, what should e to the negative x be? Infinity. Infinity. 
should be positive infinity. Good. Everybody good with those four? Yep. All right. Cool. So we're going to use these four limits that we now know, which you're going to commit to memory, to evaluate some more complicated limits that involve cubes. So this is the first one we're going to look at here. Any ideas on how we're going to start this one? Could we try and factor the like expression in the exponent? All right, we could. Um, you got a good way for that to factor? Um, I don't know. I haven't tried it yet, but it probably <laughs> won't work. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that one actually factors out real nicely. Um, yeah, I don't think it does. But we don't need to factor it anyway. What we're actually going to do is we're going to make a substitution. I like that idea of factoring, but it doesn't, it doesn't work out here. We're going to substitute out that entire exponent. And we're going to get out the whole exponent so that it just becomes e to the u. So we're going to let u equal 6 minus 2x minus 5x squared. And if I do that, this turns into a limit as x approaches infinity of e to the u, which is uh, great because e to the u is a simple function, but not so great because we have a limit as x approaches infinity, and we need this to be a limit as u approaches something, since this is e to the u. So um, as x approaches infinity, what does u approach? Negative, negative infinity. Negative infinity. Should, be going, should be going towards negative infinity because if we plug in infinity here, six is just six, and a minus two x is you know the negative infinity. But the minus five x squared, the square dominates the rest of these. The six and the minus two x kind of become insignificant. So we've got negative five infinity squared or just negative infinity. Everybody good with that? Okay. So we've got the limit as u approaches negative infinity of e to the u. So if u is going to negative infinity, what's e to the u? Zero. Zero? Exactly. It should be zero. Good. Uh, would you have to show it algebraically like this every single time with the substitution and everything? Or could you just notice that the 5x squared kind of dominates everything, which will lead to like a super negative number, which will like lead to the limit equaling zero? Um, it, yeah, it, you don't have to write it out the whole time. This is just kind of a good, um, I mean, it's good to show your work on it. But if you've got a multiple choice question, let's say, just put your answer, that's fine. But if they want to see the algebraic steps, then you need to actually write it out. <laughs> Let's look at another one. What do you think we should do with this one? You can just look at the x to the fourth since the rest is kind of insignificant. Yeah, the rest of it's not going to really matter. The x to the fourth is what's going to dominate this. Um, we're going to write it out as u equals x to the fourth minus 2x plus 1. And what does u approach if x is approaching negative infinity? Infinity? Positive infinity, right? Because a negative to the fourth is going to give us positive. So showing all our work, we'll say the limit as u approaches infinity of e to the u. And what does that equal? Infinity. Infinity. Everybody good with that? Wait, hold on. Maybe you explained this before, but um, uh, I don't understand why we would put this as limit as u approaches infinity, because isn't it clearly asking the limit as x approaches negative infinity? It is. It's asking us as x approaches negative infinity, but what happens to our u value, which is x to the fourth minus 2x plus 1, as x goes to negative infinity? 
well, the x to the fourth piece of it dominates the minus 2x and the plus 1 because of the power of 4. And so what happens if you take a very large negative number and raise it to the fourth power, you get a very large positive number. So as x goes to negative infinity, our u value goes towards positive infinity. And so as we rewrite the limit, instead of having x go to negative infinity, we'll have u go to positive infinity as we go, as we look at the function e to the u instead of the function e to the x to the fourth minus 2x plus 1. Does that make sense or no? Wait, so the people who make the test don't care that we just changed up the variables? Not at all. Yeah, it's a common technique for solving limits. In fact, we're going to we're not going to do it today, but we're going to get through a bunch of problems where we do variable substitutions. And variable substitutions are pretty common in in higher math stuff to work around complicated looking things. Now these aren't super complicated looking, but they're they're used all the time to get around complicated situations. Okay. Yep. Wait, so why then is the u substitution even needed? I mean, it's, it's Can't you just like input the negative infinity to the x. You can, yeah. Um, I just think visually it's easier for some people to follow along that way. If you're and if you're looking, uh, if you're looking at this problem on the AP test, they're going to assume that you know what the function e to the u or e to the x looks like but they're not going to assume that you know what the function e to the x to the fourth minus 2x plus 1 looks like. So they kind of are going to want you to, to break it down into a simpler function that you should know the behavior of, one that you know, most people in this class will know, or every person in this class will know the behavior of, whereas you may not know exactly what x, e to the x to the fourth minus 2x plus 1 looks like exactly. Okay. But if you, get, if you can do it in your head, um, on multiple choice, by all means, go for it. But if you're sitting there on a free response, they're going to want some some work shown. Um, if, if you just wrote, okay, this equals e to the infinity, which equals infinity, that's probably good enough for them. But to be more thorough is always better. Okay. Let's do a couple more of these and then uh, we're almost done for the day. So as x goes towards negative infinity, we want to look at e to the 2 plus x cubed. And so we can, we can write this out without the substitution. Does the, does the 2 or does the x cubed dominate that exponent? x cubed. The x cubed dominates it. And as x goes to negative infinity, what does x cubed go towards? Negative infinity. Negative infinity. So this is effectively e to the negative infinity, which is zero. zero. So yeah, that, I mean, that would be fine. If you did that for me, I'm fine with that. I just think showing the substitution on the AP test is, you know, better chances of an annoyed, angry AP test grader not taking points away if you algebraically show out all those steps. But most teachers would probably be fine with this. All right, let's take a look at this one. As x goes towards zero from the right, we're looking at e to the one over x. So what do we have going on there? We have one divided by a very small positive number. And what is one divided by a very small positive number? Infinity. So, yeah, it's positive, very large positive, positive infinity. So we've got e to the infinity, which is infinity. If we wanted to write that out using a substitution with u equal to one over x, um, we could do that. But yeah, we'll skip that for now. Any questions on that? All right. What about these two? Just focus on the highest exponent. All right. If we just focus on the highest exponent 
what's happening here. We end up with e to the infinity, which is infinity, right? Um, but we've also got we've got a bunch of other stuff going on here, right? We're gonna we can't just look at one of them. We have to we have to look at the rest. This becomes minus infinity. This becomes plus infinity. And what is the what are the next two terms become? Negative infinity. Mm, no, nope. this one. If if e is going to the negative infinity, that should be zero. Zero. Oh, and then zero. This last one should also be zero. So, well, it looks like it would be a good idea to just focus on that biggest infinity, and we may end up still with an answer of infinity. We can't be guaranteed of that because infinity minus infinity is another indeterminate form. So we got to find a way to work around that indeterminate form. So. See if you can come up with a way to work around that form. Um, All right, so anybody got an idea on that? Or how can we deal with that? All those infinities, the infinity minus infinity plus infinity, that indeterminate stuff. Any ideas? We substitute the infinity. Um, you can only substitute out a variable. Um, but we're actually not going to do any substitution here. We're actually going to do something else. I know we've been doing a bunch of substitutions. So that makes sense. It seems like we should do some more, but we're not actually going to. If negative four is a is it considered a constant? Uh, the negative four, yeah, in front of the e to the six x, yeah, that's a constant. Because then wouldn't we be able to pull it out of the equation? Um, only if it's multiplied by everything. Oh, okay. negative four. And four oh, yeah, that's right. All right, so Can you which factor? Yeah, we're gonna factor. And so which pieces of this are not a problem? These two pieces, right, are not a problem. Plus zero, minus zero, that's okay. The ones with the negative exponents. So could I factor out something that makes most of what's inside the parentheses negative exponents? The answer is yes. How about e to the 10x? If I factor e to the 10x out of e to the 10x, what do I get? Should get one. one. What, if I, what if I factor e to the 10x out of negative four e to the 6x? I should end up with negative four e to the negative four x. And if I factor out an e to the 10x out of three e to the x, I should get three e to the negative nine x. And I can sort of not even worry about those last two, right? Because these are already plus zero and minus zeros. And now when I plug in this infinity here, e to the 10x is infinity, and I have one minus zero plus zero, and we just end up with infinity, which is what we were thinking the answer would be if we just looked at this biggest term. But we need to be able to algebraically show that we can get rid of that indeterminate form. Any questions on that? Does that make sense or no? So when you pull out the e to the 10x, it's kind of just like it's subtracting 10x from the exponents. Yep, exactly. Right. To make the negative so they equal zero. Right, exactly. If I need to, if I were to distribute this e to the 10x back in, I should get the same things in here. So e to the 10x uh, times the e to the negative 4x should give me 6x, and the 10 e to the 10x times the e to the negative 9x should give me just e to the x. Okay. Yep. Um, is that why you want to use the biggest exponent? That way, when you factor it out, the rest of them become negative, the ones that aren't zero. That's correct. Yep. 
Okay, so if x was approaching negative infinity instead of infinity, then we would be trying to make all the exponents positive so that they equal zero. Uh, sorry, say that again. My kid said something. Um, so instead of, if the question um, has x approaching negative infinity instead of positive infinity, uh -huh. then we would be trying to make all the exponents positive so that they equal zero. That's correct, right? So if we look at this one below, this one is already zero minus zero plus zero, which is great. And then plus infinity minus infinity, right? And so there's our indeterminate form again. So yeah, we want to factor out to make all of these ones, I'm uh, sorry, all of the negative ones positive. So we're going to factor out the largest negative exponent. So we're going to take out e to the negative 15x. And if I do that, I can, you know, I can make this one, we'll leave those in this time, e to the 25x minus 4, um, e to the, the 20, um, 20 and 19, I can, I can do addition. Oh, that's 21, I can't do addition. 21x plus 3e to the 16x plus 2. <laughs> so 13x? So 13x and then minus 9. Everybody good with that? Yep. And as, oops, as x goes to negative infinity, this thing out here, the e to the negative 15x, is just what? Just infinity. And then we got. 0 minus 0 plus 0 plus 0 minus 9, giving us negative infinity. So if you were to get like infinity times 0, would that be in indeterminate? Um, infinity times 0 is indeterminate, yeah. OK. Yep, unfortunately so. Wait, why is it negative infinity and not positive infinity? Uh, because we have this negative 9 in here. So we got 0, oh, 0, 0, 0, 0, minus 9. So it's negative 9 times infinity. And infinity okay. Yeah. Yep. Uh, did we end up factoring uh, e to the 10th in the first part? Say that again? The, did we factor e to the 10th out of 2e to the negative 2 to the x power? And like. Um, yeah, I mean, I didn't actually write that part out because I was saying these ones are already zero. And I, really, the only reason I didn't do it is because I was running out of room here and they were insignificant. Uh, do we need to do that? Make this eraser smaller. You could. Uh, that's, that's apparently too small. We can throw those in there. I should throw those in there and be thorough about this. So, Wait, um, so for the first three, uh constants in the in the negative infinity part do you not uh -huh. have to do those or you can you can leave them out you should still write them but you don't have to include them in the part that you're factoring if you don't want to so you could write e to the 10x minus 4 e to the 6x plus 3 e to the x and then do um, leave that by itself and then say plus 2 e to the 13x minus 9 times e to the negative 15x and only factor out the piece from the two terms that need it factored out from if you want. Okay. Yeah. All right, we got two more problems that we're going to look at real quick. Well, actually, three more. We got one more after this one also. Um, so, you guys are all familiar with what the graph of natural log looks like, I hope. Here it is, just to refresh your memory in case you don't remember, natural log of x. Um, so as we go towards infinity, it's increasing without bound towards infinity. And as we go towards zero from the right-hand side, it's going down towards negative infinity. Everybody good with that graph? Yep. OK, cool. So we're going to do. Uh, the limit as x approaches infinity of natural log of 4x squared plus 5x minus 2. We're going to turn this just into natural log of u 
so that it's <laughs> representing a function that we're very familiar with, the one we just looked at. Um, and as x goes towards infinity, what is u going towards? Infinity. Infinity. So this should be the limit as u approaches infinity of natural log of u, which is? Infinity. Infinity. And what about this one on the bottom? We're going to do the same thing as u, if u is 4x, it's terrible. Let's try that again. If u is 4x squared plus 5x minus 2, and x is going to negative infinity, what's u going to? Infinity. Negative infinity. It should oh, still infinity. be positive infinity because we're squaring that x, right, which is the negative part, which makes it positive times the 4. And so effectively, when we look at this one, we're still looking at the limit as u approaches infinity of ln u, which is still just infinity. Good or no? Good. All right, last one of the day then, here we go. What should we let u equal? One over one over x to the fourth minus eight x. Sounds like a good start. So if x is going towards negative infinity, what is u going towards? Infinity. So the, yeah. Denom yeah, the denominator is going towards infinity, right? Negative infinity to the fourth is positive infinity, and that dominates this x to the first power. So the bottom is like a positive infinity, and one divided by positive infinity is zero, right? And an important point to note about this is that this denominator is always, as x goes to negative infinity, that denominator is always going to be positive, isn't it? Yeah. You guys agree? Yeah. And the numerator is also positive. And so if x is approaching negative infinity, u is approaching zero using only positive numbers. So u is approaching zero from the right which is important in this one because as we re or as we do this substitution, we have u approaches zero from the right of ln u. As u approaches zero from the right of natural log, what do you get? Negative infinity. Negative infinity. But if I just had the limit as u approaches zero of natural log, looking at the graph again, can I have a two-sided limit as u approaches zero of natural log? No. Can't because no. there's not an open interval to both sides. So we always want to be as specific as we possibly can. We're approaching zero from the right hand side, not just approaching zero. Because otherwise, this would be it doesn't exist. Even though technically, since it's negative infinity, it still technically doesn't exist. Um, we want to be as specific as we possibly can. And that's it. That's uh, most of what we're going to talk about with limits. We're going to add a few more things in. The next week and we're going to talk about the idea of continuity next week that'll probably take monday and and maybe a little bit of tuesday and then we're going to move forward from there any questions on anything we've done today um can you go to the slide with um the limit as x approaches zero from the right of one over e to the x yeah how do you Oh, oh, never mind. Okay. <laughs> I thought it was 1 over e to the x with e to the 1 over x. Okay. <laughs> I was like, how did you get to e to the negative infinity? Okay, I got it. <laughs> Thank you. No problem. Any other questions?